This Sing conference will now be um, recorded. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. And my name is Jonathan Graham. Um, just John is fine. Um, I'm one of the inspectors with the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. Um, I've been asked to give a little bit of a brief um, rundown of my experience. And um, so, I started ooh, going on for about um, 18 years ago um, with Carillion. If you remember them. Um, in SNC renewals and rail maintenance and various bits and bobs with them for a good number of years. Um, I then worked for a period of time with um, Flatbed Investigation for White Young Green and Pandrol, doing a lot of their international work. And then about eight or nine years ago, I went over to Nottingham Tram and was their track engineer and then later track asset manager, um, managing a lot of the um, maintenance at Nottingham Tram and also looking at the phase two extension if you're familiar with that um, and then three and a half years ago i moved over to raib as one of their inspectors um, so i specialize in track in pway particularly in plain line but also dabbling quite a few other things as well as i'll touch on in the presentation so that's my kind of background very much pway focus um, but nowadays with the PW, with um, the RVIB, you kind of get involved in all kinds of things. So let's go. So the presentation today, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. Um, hopefully it shouldn't be um, too onerous. I'm about to get attacked by my cat, which is the perils of working from home. There we go. Um, so a little bit of history, a little bit of the background as to how the branch was established and why it was established. I'll talk a little bit about what we do, why we do it, who are the kind of people that work for us and the kind of things we look at. Um, and then towards the end, we'll look at some of the themes we see quite a lot and um, we'll talk about some of those. And we'll talk about some of the investigations we are doing and some of the investigations we have done. Um, I'll caveat it now. Obviously, I will talk very briefly about some of the things we've got going on at the moment, but they are ongoing investigations. So I can't go into too much detail other than what's already in the public domain. So I make no apology for that. I'm sure you understand. Um, so without further ado, why do we bother? Well, you will have seen these kind of quotes all over the place. Ultimately, if you make if you don't learn from your mistakes, you will make them all over again. Um, this is a one that's over 100 years old now um, from George Santiona, and it seems like common sense to us now, I think, but you know, in the past, maybe this wasn't done as much as we think it was. So let's learn from our mistakes. You will have seen models like this before, the idea that for every fatal accident, there's quite a few dangerous occurrences. There's even more precursor events and there's even more near misses. Um, a couple of interesting things, things about this model. Well, actually, in pure terms of safety learning, what you can learn, you can learn as much from any layer of this pyramid. So you don't have to wait for a fatality to learn the lessons. You can learn those lessons from the near misses. So that is always a good thing to do, obviously, because we want to learn those lessons at the earliest available opportunity. The other thing is, is that this pyramid can scale. So if you reduce the number of near misses, you have everything above it shrinks with it. Um, I'm very happy to report um, that and I recently saw from Nick Millington that there's been a reduction in the number of near misses with track workers. That would, in turn, if you think about this model, lead to a reduction in the number of dangerous incidents and in turn a reduction in the, in the number of fatalities. I'm going to take you back to about 20 years ago. Um, the late 90s, early 2000s were a difficult time for our industry. I'm sure many of the people on the call today will remember um, some of these accidents, Southall, Potter's Bar, T-Bay, Hatfield, um, in particular for as rail infrastructure engineers, we think about Potter's Bar and Hatfield as being key turning points in P-way terms. Um, later on, if you think of Grey Rig, which was 2007, that is also a significant turning point in some of the ways we might maintain and the componentry we've got in SNC. Um, Hatfield, of course, um, if we think about that, we think about gauge corner cracking and rolling contact fatigue and all the big changes that have happened to our industry because of it. Um, not a good time for the industry, though. And the big spike in 1999 is Ladbroke Grove. 
Labrock Road was a head-on collision between two trains, um, a, an express train and a commuter train, effectively, head-on collision due to a SPAD. Um, 31 people lost their lives on, in that accident, and over 500 were injured. It could have been a lot worse. It was bad enough as it was. Now, in the wake of Labrock Road, there was a public inquiry led by Lord Cullen. Um, that public inquiry was actually split into two sections. The first section was very much focused on the incident itself, why it happened, and very much doing an accident investigation into Labrock Grove. The second part of that inquiry was actually probably the more sweeping and the one that's led to major change. And that was a shake up of the way that railway safety is managed in our industry. So the second half of that report led to the creation of this 2003 Railways and Transport Safety Act. Now, if, you were back, if you're in the industry back around 2000, you will remember um, with quite some detail, I'm sure, this body called Her Majesty's Railway Inspector at the H. These guys were involved at all levels of the management of safety. Um, they were involved in, um, in tackling approvals, in, do, in looking at incident investigation, in looking at regulation. They were involved at all stages. Part of Lord Cullen's report noted that safety investigations were not a separate and independent process. The HMI were involved in the safety investigation, but they were also involved in the approvals that may have led to the incident in the first place. So you're kind of in this scenario where you've got someone effectively marking their own homework, which Lord Cullen noted was not where really we should be. Now also there was legislation from Europe saying that each member nation should have their own independent accident investigation for rail. That's very much the model used in the aviation industry. So the HMRI was effectively split. Now this is quite simplistic, it was a bit more complex than that, but effectively three arms came out of the HMRI. The first one was the regulator. So the Office of Rail and Road, as they are now, originally called the Office of Rail Regulation, and um, that is where a lot of people who would still call themselves H Her Majesty's Railway Inspectors now sit. They're the people who basically will come and regulate your railway, whether you are network rail or whether you are a heritage line or a line. They're also in charge of looking at health and safety at work. So very much the HSE of the railways. And they also have a level of economic regulation. So they'll be checking that effectively, let's say network rail, for instance, network rail are using their money correctly. And um, we'll also look at the kind of the Tox and the Fox and all these other companies. RSSB, I'm sure you're all very aware of. If you're in the light rail industry, you've now got LRSSB set up. And um, this is very much a standard setting organisation, research and development, looking at data trends, data analysis, and looking at the interfaces between companies. So whereas Network Rail have their company standards, which say what Network Rail do, RSSB will set group standards which look at the interfaces between, for instance, rail and rail. And then safety investigation is where the REIB comes. So we are purely there for accident investigation, and the output of that is to make safety investigation within the industry. So if you were to have a mission statement, and um, everyone has got one, this is ours. We are, the purpose behind us is to investigate accidents and incidents to improve railway safety, key point one, and to inform the public, key point two. Now, the first point, improving railway safety, we do that by making recommendations for change, and those recommendations come out of our reporting process. The second half is maybe more subtle, and is maybe the bit people don't realise, and that is that we have a duty to inform the public. So everything we publish is freely available on the gov.uk website. So if you go to raib.gov.uk, you can see every single report we have ever published. Now, the reason that's important is that it saves, a lot of the time, massive public inquiries from happening. So the likes of Lord Cullen's inquiry from Ladbroke Grove aren't really needed in quite the same way anymore because you have an independent um, safety branch doing that investigation absolutely independently of all of the parties and without establishing lay, blame or liability or going to prosecution. So we are quite fiercely defensive of the fact we are independent 
and fiercely defensive of the fact that we aren't there to blame people, we are purely there for safety reasons. Give you an idea of the kind of things we cover and the scope of what we cover. Right, the easiest one to cover, first of all, is all of network rail. Every single bit of network rail infrastructure that is passenger line in particular, but um, everything up to kind of the boundary with industrial curtilages and the like um, is in scope. So from the north of Scotland, we've got the train on the left there is up at Loch Hilt, which is on the um, Fort William to Malague line, um, right up in the heart of Scotland. We've got Greywig in the middle, which I spoke about earlier, um, one of the major incidents we've really had to cover, and then Watford on the right, which we'll talk about later. So if it's on network rail infrastructure, it is in scope. We also cover all of the trams and the metro systems, and the left-hand picture is Croydon. We'll talk about that later, because that is, again, a major incident for us. Um, but we also cover the metros. Now, in particular, metros-wise, um, Tyne and Weir metro is probably a light rail system more than a metro. A metro, in the traditional sense, is an underground system. So we only have two in this country, really, and that's the London Underground, Glasgow, Clockwork Orange. Um, but with, both of those are in scope. We also cover the channel tunnel up to the halfway point, which is where the border is nominally. But we do work with our French counterparts. So if something happens in their half, we'll help them and vice versa. We're not, we're not really um, overly precious about it. That is the, the formal jurisdiction is up to halfway. And we also cover the heritage sector. So the heritage, if your heritage railway crosses a public road, then it's in scope for us. Um, we also cover a few of the more esoteric places. So we, in scope here is the Cairngorm Mountain Railway, um, the Clandidno um, Tramway, and other such kind of um, small and weird and wonderful um, railways out and about. So I think we've got about 100 heritage or non kind of mainline networks um, in scope. Now, what do we investigate? Well, actually, we have a legal precedent here. So the 2003 Railways and Transport Safety Act, which Lord this inquiry um, led to actually states what we have to investigate. Uh, we have to investigate a serious rail accident um, which has an obvious impact on railway safety regulation or management and involves the collision or derailment. That's an important bit, or could result. Now, the key thing is if, if someone unfortunately loses their life, or if we get serious injuries to a, more than five or more people, I'll be honest, if we're getting serious injuries, we'll have a look anyway. Um, if there's extensive damage, which nominally is two million euros or more, um, and the key one on the right hand side there, any other incident which under slightly different circumstances could have led to some one of the first three boxes there. And that's the kind of near miss clause. If you get a near miss with a track worker, for instance, if he's a second away from being struck by a train, that's still a very serious incident and we'll have a look at it. Um, if it's not mandated, then we have discretion about whether we investigate or not and we will come to a decision as a branch every monday we sit down as a collective branch with all the inspectors the chief inspector the deputy whoever's around that day we will we will sit down at the moment via microsoft teams normally um, in our conference rooms and we will look at jobs which we feel might have some safety learning to them and we will make a decision about whether we undertake a full investigation or not and that is normally based on how serious the incident is and if there's any going to be any safety learning coming out of it, or at least we think there is. And those two kind of, um, those two questions will be going through our mind when we look at those jobs. But if we don't investigate, that doesn't mean that nothing happens. Um, for instance, if there's a worker incident, and that is a kind of health and safety at work type incident, then we don't have jurisdiction to look at it anyway. And that now goes to either the LRR or the HSE, depending where it happens. It happens on the railway, effectively, it's the OLR. If it happens in a depot away from the railway, it's a, it's a HSE thing. But there's a, they will work together. If it's trespass or suicide, that by definition is not an accident. So it's now a crime and will be looked at by the police. Um, and if there's a kind of accident where there is, we don't think there's going to be significant safety burning, or at least nothing new, then we will, um, we will say to the duty holders, it's your duty to investigate. Now, regardless of whether we investigate or not, under ROGS, which is the regulations from the LRR, duty holders have a, a have a responsibility to investigate regardless of whether the RAIB investigates or not. So if you're, for instance, work for Network Rail and there's an incident 
there may well be an RAIB investigation going on, but there'll also be a network rail investigation going on. There might also be an OOR investigation going on, etc. Um, a little bit about who we are, the kind of people we've got. So we have a relatively small team. We are split into effectively two halves. There's a, an inspectorate and then there's a support staff. It's about between 20 and 25 in each. It goes up and down a bit, obviously, due to staff. But nominally, we are, the inspectorate is, is um, 23 at the moment. Uh, and that includes 18 inspectors and five. So the principal inspectors kind of manage and the inspectors do the work effectively. We've got two officers, um, one in Derby, one in Farndra. Um, now that looks like an odd geographical split, but the reality is that the southeast is so densely populated with railway around London in particular that that actually kind of works for a balance of the amount. Um, in up in Scotland, the, the, the geographical spread is big, but the actual amount of track miles is low. So we find that Derby and Farnborough works quite well. If we get a job in the wilds of Scotland, um, then we could, we sometimes deploy the Farnborough inspectors from Heathrow up on a plane, maybe, as opposed to um, trying to drive from Derby. But we can kind of balance that, depending on what incident comes in. The, at all times, we have five people on call. Those five people, we have a duty coordinator, the duty coordinator feels the calls and acts as kind of the first filter. Um, they don't leave their house or the office. They are permanently on the phone and they remain, they don't deploy to site. They are kind of like the call center effectively. Um, and then we have at least two inspectors at Derby and the same at Farnborough ready to deploy at the drop of a hat. And that's 24 7, 365 days a year. Um, so, regardless of whether your accident happens, if your accident happens on Christmas Day, we'll still come out and, and just grumble at you for missing our Christmas dinner, probably. Um, just this. Um, a little bit about um, our inspectors. Our inspectors are um, generally ex-rail industry, but not exclusively. So the majority have come from a railway engineering background because a lot of our, our investigations have a rail, railway engineering focus. But we also have people from the police. We've got some people from the regulator and the HSC. We've um, recently recruited um, some extra people with human factors experience. Um, we've also got one guy who's from the BTP who's got a lot of expertise in kind of scene management and major incident management. But regardless of your background, you are trained to be a generalist. So we have a um, that's a rather extensive um, suite of training that we go through. So even though I'm a track person, I can at least hold my own if I go to a signaling job, rolling stock job, um, or if it's a track worker job or something like that. Um, I never thought I'd have to learn so much about signaling until I joined the RAIB. And now well, I'm no expert, but I've got enough underpinning knowledge that I can have a sensible conversation with people. And you often find yourself at the end of an investigation sat across the table from the industry leaders of a particular subject and yet you're the one telling them what went wrong as opposed to the way around and that's what can happen with one of our investigations is that you become a bit of a closet expert in a particular subject over quite a short space of time the other thing we're all trained up to be um kind of um, forensic investigators as well so we look at evidence collection evidence analysis we look at interviews, so we know we have extensive training in interviewing people and about how to actually get the best out of people to interview. But all of that doesn't mean we lose our specialism. So I'm still the track expert for RAIB. So if there's a track job, it might not be my investigation, but I'll get involved in on a kind of advisory basis or a checking and balances type basis. The key thing is that there's an expert for virtually everything in the branch and everyone's phone is virtually on all the time. So if there's ever a problem, we can access the people with the knowledge. In order to do our job, we have a number of powers, and these are legal powers, very similar to the police. And we have a power of entry, so we can enter property without warrant. And we can, that can be railway property or land adjoining the railway or any other land. Now, why they didn't just say any land in the first place, I don't know, but they're the three things. Um, effectively, if I show you my warrant card, you have no, it's an, it's an offence to stop me if I feel it's got um, just cause for the investigation. 
we can seize evidence, we can take photos, videos, make records, and we can seize documents and records. Now, the penultimate public point there is the strange one and the one that is a bit different to the police. So if we interview you in a formal interview, you do not have the right of silence like you would in a police interview because you're not being interviewed under caution. We're not out to get you, we're not prosecuting you, we don't, we're not trying to incriminate you or anything. That is the police's job or the OLR's job. And we are purely there to learn safety lessons so you don't have the ability to go no comment. Or if you do, you're committing an offence by not answering my questions. That's subtly different to what you would get in, for instance, a police interview where you have a right of silence. Um, a little bit about how we learn about accidents, how we know to respond. So um, every duty holder on the railway, a duty holder is either an infrastructure manager like Network Rail or an operating company such as, um, for instance, um, I was, yeah, Virgin West Coast, I was about to say, but Avanti West Coast now. Um, duty holders have a legal, regular, a legal obligation under 2005 Railway accident and incident reporting regulations to inform us of an incident. And that kind of spreadsheet on the right there is a list that all our duty holders should have in their control rooms, which gives them a list of when they should inform us, whether it's immediately, whether it's via a form within a day or two, or whether it's on like a weekly return, depending on the severity of the incident. Regardless, we say, if you're not sure, give us a call. And if the DC, when they, that person takes the call, thinks actually we need to have a look at this, he will deploy inspectors straight away. Maybe um, we have something called AAs, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, while the inspectors are traveling to site, the DC will continue to manage that incident to try and keep things moving, to try and make sure that we're not holding things up unnecessarily. When we get to site, lead inspector takes over and we will prepare what we call a preliminary examination um, and that preliminary examination is where we basically hoover up the evidence enough that we can make a decision of how we progress. That is normally a case of let's get all the evidence first, let's get site handed back and we can worry about analysis later. Um, well, so when we get to site, that evidence hoovering, effectively we use our powers to collect them. Can be anything. It can be something very large. For instance, we'll talk a little bit about Armand later, but it's something like Armand, we have seized entire trains. And it could be something very small, but it could be some photos, some records, some paperwork. So whatever it is, we have the ability to legally seize it. And we also have that ability to get people to give statements and they are legally protected. As I said before, you don't have a right of silence, but the flip side is that record of interview between you and us isn't disclosable to the police unless they go right up to the High Court. And as of yet, that's never been successful. Uh, excuse me. We liaise on site with all of the parties. We're not in the we're not in the business of kind of um, keeping all our cards close to our chests or anything or anything. We work with everyone as best we can and we share evidence, we share um, photos, we'll share technical evidence, we'll work together because that's in everyone's best interest. And the other thing we'll do is try and get the railway back to the duty holder as quickly as possible. Now, that can sometimes be difficult because you've got to balance the requirements of getting the railway open with actually doing the investigation, but we'll have sensible grown-up conversations about it, and that might be a staged handback, so you can have the train back now, but we need the site, or you can have that bit of the site back now, but we'll keep this bit for the minute. You know, we'll just have a sensible conversation about it. In order to help us with that, we have a number of accredited agents, these are actually people in the railway industry. Um, so this might be some people on this call, I don't know. So you may well work for instance for Network Rail, or we've got an awful lot who work for um, control rooms. In Network Rail, it's generally LOMS, MOMS, and that kind of level, so operations managers. And these are guys who Network Rail can release to effectively work for us for a short period of time in order to kind of hit the ground running. So they can see some evidence, they can take some um, photos, they can protect evidence on site, they might be able to start making certain um, liaisons on our behalf. One thing they cannot do is, is interview people, they are not allowed to do that, but other than that they've pretty much got all the rights that an inspector has got with permission from the RERB, so we have to give them permission to do something, but they have that legal power to do it.
the kind of evidence we collect is quite vast and in worst cases we, we might actually go and liaise with the coroner or with, with a pathologist if someone's unfortunately lost their life and thankfully we don't have to do that very often but if we need to we will and um, we'll also look at a lot of electronic data nowadays that's far more common now than it was so for instance the, the first things we're looking for in a lot of cases is the OTDR the on-train data recorder the equivalent of a black box um, which would give us a lot of telematic data from the train we'll also be getting forward-facing cctv a lot of the rolling stock now has forward-facing cctv i think the majority now some of the older things maybe not um, but that can give us a, the driver's eye view effectively and um, a lot of passenger trains have internal cctv which can give us some clues about people's injuries if they've been in a, in a crash for instance and then on site we'll be taking all kinds of photos surveys drone surveys um, we'll be getting paperwork maintenance records we might take things to the lab, undertake testing, whatever we need to do. I mentioned this earlier, there might be multiple investigations going on at once. Whatever is going on, wherever possible, we'll try and share information between us because that makes sense that everyone's using the same information. Um, there's no secrets. There's no underhand between these parties because we work together really well. Um, the only thing that we cannot release to other people is witness statements and witness detail that's protected by law and we if we release those then we are committing an offence so um an reib witness interview is just for reib and if the police or the or the, or um network Rail or someone wants to interview those people separately they'll have to do that separately a little bit about the timeline of how we do things and um, the site phase is actually quite short compared to the full process and um, as many of you will know, one of our reports does take time to come out. It is normally, um, you know, the best part of a year, say 10 months, something like that. Um, that is because there is actually an awful lot that goes on in the background that just takes time because of the necessity of it. So we'll hoover up the evidence in the investigation phase, we'll undertake some analysis, and then we have what we call a final analysis review. And this is like the gateway for the report to start being written. So in the final analysis review, the inspector in charge will sit down with um, the chief inspector and deputy chief inspector and go through all the findings, go through all the conclusions and go through the areas we're planning to make recommendations. And the chief inspector will effectively go yes or no, or you need to work, we need some more information here. I'm not happy with that bit, I'm happy with that bit. It might be in a bit more work, it might be that he's, ha he's happy and we can go straight into drafting. It just depends. But that's the kind of gateway review to start writing the report. Um, a report gets written and goes through an internal um, approval process, firstly to um, the investigation manager, then the deputy chief inspector, then the chief inspector. So what comes out at the other end has been through quite a few sets of eyes to check for that we're being reasonable, that we're being consistent. And it kind of comes out in a corporate format. So regardless of who writes it, the end result should appear the same. Um, but when we get to when we finish drafting that report, we have an extensive consultation phase, and we're required to do this by law. So, um, if you are if you've been involved in an accident or if you're affected by what we're proposing, then you have a right of reply. You have an ability to have a look, see it in advance, and go, "I don't agree with X, Y, and Z because of A, B, and C." And then we we will look at your um, your objections or your comments, and we'll, we'll we'll reply to you and say, "Okay." we take that point on board or we don't agree with you there because of this and because of that. So that consultation phase can take time and but we make sure that that consultation phase is done correctly because the last thing you want is if you're kind of involved in an incident is the first thing you hear about the report coming out is when it's on the news. So we're very careful with that phase. It's what adds a bit of time to the tail end. And then the submission goes through the formal submission to the Secretary of State who's our boss effectively and then it's published. So that's why sometimes the back end of the report does take a bit of time. Um, I know some people kind of wonder what goes on in that kind of murky world of the RAIB. And the result of that is recommendations. Now, a bit of a strange thing with the recommendations is that while we make them, we don't have the responsibility for following them up. That lies with the LLR. So as part of our consultation process, we actually undertake a two-stage consultation with the LLR because they're going to be getting work because of what we 
so they have a little bit more time than most people to have a look at those recommendations to sit to check that we are being reasonable with what we're asking and once we've made the recommendation whoever we address that recommendation to has a duty to implement it or provide justification if they don't or somewhere in between if they implement it by a different method that is a perfectly valid way of if, if it satisfies the intent of the recommendation and um, but if we don't and um, believe that the recommendation has been closed out correctly we have a we have mechanisms with the LLR to raise that up to them if we think look that's not been closed out right that's not what we intended so there's mechanisms in place a little bit with where we are we have currently published in the history of the branch which is 15 years and um, about 350 past investigations there not an investigation to one incident but a kind of around a theme so for instance we've just published a uh, class investigation a few months ago about um kind of human factors with signals for instance and so we're not looking at one incident we're looking at quite a number of incidents with signals to see how if there's any recommendations that can be made on a kind of general basis rather than on a specific incident we've also published 90 safety digest or bulletins they're kind of um where we don't need to do a full investigation we just we've seen it we've seen it before but we think there's still a message that needs to go out there so we publish a, a short report maybe three four sides of paper that kind of thing and 300 industry reviews and these are where we've told the duty holders you do the investigation but keep us informed of your findings and we might chip in if we feel that there's something else we might even shepherd you to look at a particular thing we've currently got 16 investigations going on there's a list of them. I'll talk about a couple of them very briefly. Excuse me. Um, you will, I'm sure, notice a few that you recognise. And the two I want to raise, well, a few in particular, um, we'll talk very briefly about Margam, which is at the bottom. Um, the, let me just go into Carmont, I think is the easiest way. So Carmont, um, on the 12th of August this year, um, a High speed train and um, you know, HST and Intercity 125 came off the rails um, at Carmont, which is just south of Stonehaven, just west of Stonehaven up in Scotland. And I can't go into any more detail than, what's in the, than what you will find on our website so far. And um, effectively, you will see that um, from that, that the first power car went down the embankment. The first and second carriages, you can see on that picture on the right, are upside down. And the third carriage went down the embankment after the power car, and then the fourth carriage ended up on top. We were fortunate that that was a very sparsely um, populated train. Normally, that train would be very busy. Um, maybe due to COVID, um, there were only nine people on that train. Unfortunately, three people still lost their lives, um, including two members of staff. So um, it's been 13 years since a passenger lost their lives on the railway the last time was grey rig in 2007 so a pretty sad time for us as an industry um, the carmont site has only recently um, um, gone back to service there's been extensive um, remedial works needed and the, the recovery was very difficult required extensive tempering civil engineering works to get the craneage down there because this happened um, kind of in the middle of nowhere really away from the road in a cutting in a cutting and um, so a really difficult site to recover. At this, while that was going on, just, just over two weeks later, um, you will have seen there was a large train fire, Morlaise Junction, which is in Carmarthenshire in South Wales, and um, a train hauling um, a load of fuel wagons coming up from Milford Haven derailed at Morlaise Junction. And the third wagon in the rake, the four wheels on that wagon um, were locking up as it traveled three of them kind of turned turned a bit but the leading axle locked up completely and um, led to a big wheel flat and then as the train traversed small ace junction effectively one bit of the train went one way at the junction and another bit of the train went another way at the junction and that led to the derailment now actually from a human perspective the the two members of crew i think it was that were on board saw what was happening detached the locomotive um, credit to them and drove it away and so actually from a human perspective and um, not a serious incident but from an environmental perspective this was a disaster i think there was something about a third of a million liters of fuel 
and leaked out of these wagons and there's an estuary that this is crossing uh, i'm not sure if it's a triple si or a nature reserve but it's, it's an area of um certainly of of beauty and of a lot of nature there so um, an environmental catastrophe really and a significant fire as well i mean i'm sure you've seen on the news um, we'll talk about some of the kind of standard themes we see running through so um, i'll put this graph together this is in the last almost three years now so this is things we've published in the last three years if you um from the start um, you can see that near misses with staff level crossings, one of our biggest customers, um, non-stops and runaways and derailments is close behind. We get some others, the other bar is quite big, that's because we do get some oddballs, and um, we'll talk about a couple of them later, um, but we'll dwell on a few of the bigger bars as we go through the next couple of slides. And um, this is actually before that time, but it's significant accidents so I think it's worth talking about. Sandylands, um, I, I was actually working for Nottingham Tram when this occurred. Um, I've seen one of, a couple of my colleagues on the call today, so they'll remember this as well. Um, this incident shook the tram world, shook the light rail world, because this wasn't something we ever thought would happen. Um, this tram overturned as it um, took the corner at Sandylands Junction. There's a video here which I hope should play well over the um, over the meeting. So the tram was travelling from the bottom right at New Addington and it got to Lloyd Park. Now it's November, so it's it's almost it's almost the anniversary actually. Six o'clock in the morning. I'm sure if you when you wake up at six in the morning at the moment, it's pitch black. So five past six, the tram um starts going up this very long straight into three tunnels. Um so it's cold, it's dark, and it's not a nice place to be really. As the tram approaches the corner at Sandylands, there's a 20 kilometres an hour speed limit. That's 12 and a half miles an hour for the uh, network rail people amongst us. Um, but it approaches that corner at almost 80 kilometres an hour. So it's doing three and a half to four times the uh, permitted speed. The tram exits the tunnel, 78. Now, just before the tunnel, it does begin to slow down a little but it still hits the corner at 73 kilometers an hour. So just what, 45 miles an hour roughly. And at that speed, the tram cannot negotiate that corner. And it tips onto its right hand side. And um, the windows on that right hand side, as it, um, as it fell over, uh, the majority, if not all those windows were broken and passengers on board ended up in the windows. That led to seven people, unfortunately, losing their lives. And of the remaining passengers, there were 61 injured out of 62. One person miraculously came away from that without being injured, but ev or everyone else on that train, on that tram, suffered an injury of some form. 19 of them very serious. Um, now, and if you excuse me, I've got enough at the door. Sorry, working from home again. And that led to 15 recommendations. Now, the biggest recommendation that came out of Sandylands, um, as I'm sure our light rail colleagues are all too aware, is the um, establishment of the Light Rail Safety and Standards Board. Um, this is a tram safety body that was not there um, in that form anyway, um, prior to Sandylands. But there's also a number of things which have come out which have relevance across the industry. So looking at windows and evacuation aids, looking at um, signage, visual cues, um, but also looking at things like fatigue, monitoring of drivers. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's learning for the whole industry, not just for the light rail industry here. Another thing we've seen is track worker fatalities. Now this is a, um, a difficult graph to look at anyway because of recent events. So back around sort of the turn of the millennium, um, there were, there were a fair number of, of our colleagues who unfortunately lost their life doing their work on track and but over time that began to reduce um, and 2014 when there was an, um, a fatal accident at Newark, Newark Northgate on the East Coast Main Line then actually we went going on for five years actually it was um, almost the end of 2018 that unfortunately someone lost their life at Stokes Nest um, in Croydon 
and then over the last uh, what two years now and um, unfortunately that one included sees four of our colleagues losing their life on the valley um stokes nest was the first one the two in 2019 at margham and then this year in may um a gentleman lost his life at road which is um Hanslope junction just south of northampton on the west coast mainline but they don't tell the full story. We've also had a significant number of names. Um, this list is ones that the RAIB have looked at since January 2017. This is things that have been published in 2017. So this, some of these are actually happened in 2016. But some of you will recognise some of the names there. Um, I say Margam is the one that obviously is most in our minds at the moment. Um, and but also, I'll just talk about one um, in the middle column there, which is Eglinton. I'm going to show you some CCTV in a minute. Um, this is, you can actually find it on YouTube if you so desire. Um, this is some footage from a 125 mile an hour train travelling up the East Coast Main Line in Nottinghamshire. And you'll see a level crossing coming up, and then you'll see a group of track staff on the rails. So, oh, I'll come. So this is Edmonton. Hopefully this is playing not too jerkly over the connection. So this train's doing 125 miles an hour. It might not look like it from the footage, but it is. And you might just be able to start making out some people in orange coming up. I apologise that was a bit jerky on some people's um, connections. Um, so this was a near miss with a train travelling at 125 miles an hour. Um, we had a group of people here were using um, an unofficial safe system of work. They towels was in place at this location, but because of the amount of time they were stood off, and um, they'd come up with a, um, an unofficial way of working that was when towels goes off, you begin looking for trains effectively, and you carry on working until you see one. Um, and they ultimately um, fell foul of that system because the lookout who was involved was never formally appointed and they got involved with the work. And um, there's also a lot of stuff here about client contract relationships and network rail and contract relationships. And also the fact that people realised that this wasn't quite right but didn't feel in a position to challenge. So um, if you work on track, I'd really encourage you to have a look at this report because it really does give you. Um, an insight into that, that kind of network rail contract relationship um, and how it can go wrong. Um, I'm just going to go back to Margan. Um, now, we published an interim report to Margan back in December last year. Um, our final report is due soon. I'm not sure of an exact date, but um, it's due soon. Now, I'm sure many of you will know Margam and have talked about it a lot, but it is worth mentioning again. Two of our railway industry colleagues, two of our P-Way colleagues lost their lives. A third one was awfully close. Um, they were working on an open line. Um, they were working without a formally appointed lookout. Their group had split into two. And they were a group of six, which had split into two groups of three. Um, the three people involved in the near miss were almost certainly wearing ear defenders because they were using a bounce to um, look at some nuts on some SNC. So we don't believe they were aware of the approaching train until it was too late. And um, there's some issues with understanding of paperwork, understanding of the planning process, and changing the safe system of work. And um, have a read of the interim report. I'll say the final report will be due out soon. And um, I would encourage if you work on track you should be reading that because it is um, it is an industry changing incident, an industry changing accident. Already Network Rail are making sweeping changes, um, as I'm sure you've seen through Nick Millington's safety task force. Um, not just due to Margam, but Margam has been a, um, a catalyst, certainly. Um, let's look at some more P-Way type jobs. Um, here is a derailment at East Somerset Junction, which is down in the West Country. Um, this is a derailment of a freight train coming out of Mearhead Quarry. Now, if you look at the right-hand picture, it's quite hard to make out, but there's actually the, the two right-hand lines of the main line, 
the two left hand lines are going up to the mirror head and then if you look at the bottom you can see there's a thick line in the middle now that is an out of use shunt net an out of use siding um, and the set of points which are in the middle of the shot there have been plain lined um, to because they were no longer needed now, why did this why did this development occur? Now it occurred because of gauge spread. Now, gauge spread, the gauge spread occurred because the that particular section of track had deteriorated that no one knew about it. Now that's why does no one know about it? Well, here's a little bit of a um, diagram of East Somerset Junction, and you will see the development occurred on the link line, which is um, this section, this section going into the old disused sidings. So you can see where nine, four, five points were. I don't know if this will let me do a point out like um, Now, all of network rail and uh, main lines are generally run over by a track recording train uh, at various intervals. This one should have been run over twice a year. But um, a few years back, the link line was closed for some reason. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. So all trains were being you know, sent into Mere Head Quarry um, over the branch loop in both directions, which there's an ability to you could come from the down line across the crossover, across another crossover, and onto the branch loop, which is bi-directional. So the link line was out of use, and the route setting cards on the um, track recording coach, um, they they effectively um, the one for the link line got put away, you know, got got removed from the from the um, route setting of the track recording coach because they couldn't do that route. But when the link line was brought back into use, the um, the track recording people weren't told, and so that route setting card remained out of use. So even though the line was open to traffic, the track recording vehicle was not going over it. Now the problem was the local maintenance guys thought it was, so they were getting a kind of report for what they thought was that section of track, but it was actually for the branch loop in both directions. So getting an up. And piece of document, uh, an up trace and a down trace for the branch loop. They thought that the down trace was actually the link line. So over time, the base plates deteriorated because they weren't being checked. The maintenance guys didn't think there was an issue because the trace looked okay. And, and over time, that deteriorated to the point that a train managed to break the base plate. Another development we have is at Lewisham, Court Hill South Junction. Um, this one shows that it's not just old and dilapidated track that can cause you problems. This was brand new track. They just installed a brand new double junction. And I said double junction, which is actually quite a difficult one to do because it's on a 60 millimeter cant. Um, now, modular S and C. Modular S and C is difficult at the best of times, but putting it on a 60 millimeter cant, if ever you've tried to relay track on a cant, um, sorry, large junctions on a cant, it's like laying things on the inside of a bowl, quite difficult to get. But nevertheless, they've done this. Uh, but when it came to tamping it, they had to tamp the bottom line, the one with panels 22, 21, and 30 on it. They had to tamp that twice because it was quite low from installation. Now, that meant that the, the, um, the route through panels 23, 15, 6, and 5, that route, they didn't have time to tamp it with a tamper, so they can go back to it. Now, unfortunately, that meant that the compaction on that route was not as good as the routes around it, and it's up on a 60 millimeter zooming on that section, blurry. you can see that there are three very short stub-ended um, bearers on the, end of the um, on the end of that modular bearer in the middle. See where the red arrow is pointing, you've got three kind of little stub-ends on a little tiny spine panel, um, and those three weren't compacted as well as the track around it. If you're looking cross-section, that was starting to void under traffic, so where that bearer should be on a 60 million 60 millimeter cant nominally actually it was probably on a 50 millimeter cant or 49 millimeter cant nominally and um, but the up loop on the left that voiding was starting to make the cant drop off and actually after development when we ran a train over it and we put void meters under it the cant was running 30 millimeters below design so heavy freight train comes around maybe a bit of uneven loading and um, you've got voiding, you've got uh, dynamic twist, you've got freshly ground welds, increasing your friction, all these little factors combined to the point that the left-hand wheel of one of the wagons was able to climb up and over the rail. So new track can give us problems as well as old track. 
and we also had derailment Ely. This was um, about two and a half years ago now. Um, you turn up at site and you're faced with that on the left, that bit of SNC all mangled and twisted. All of that is consequential. None of that caused the development. That's just the aftermath of the development. So when we got to site on this one, a lot of people were looking very nervously at that bit of track. And then you realize actually the train was on the other line. It was on the line um, on the right. And on the right hand picture there, you can see this container wagon. This was the one that came off. You'll notice it's got two containers on it. The red one at the back is 20 foot long. The um, silver mask one at the front is 40 foot long. But despite that, the red one weighs um, significantly more than the silver one. And that was a bit of a factor in the fact that you've got a bit of track here, which um, by track maintenance handbook um, standards is not perfect, but is OK. Um, you've got a wagon which is an offset load so if you imagine this it's like um, putting a load of concrete in the boot of your car the front of your car that's kind of riding in the air a bit same thing happened with this wagon but the problem with this one is that the dampening on the suspension of the wagon wasn't off so actually that wagon negotiated this slightly um poor well this poor and very poor bit of track um it wasn't able to balance itself and correct the, the loading on the wheels quick enough and allow the wheel to climb over and the next thing you've got a development. But not helped by the fact that you've got this miss um, this misloading, this offset load on the wagon. Um, talk a little bit about possessions. Um, this is not a particularly nice one. Um, we This ballast distributor on the right, and um, this is, um, I'm sure you may have seen one of these, this is like a a large rail boss type vehicle with a, with a ballast top on the back of the conveyor for putting ballast out. Um, this was in a possession, being driven in reverse. Um, the machine controller and the driver were both in the cab and um, driving backwards, and they could they didn't have a decent enough view of what was behind them. But they were traveling through an area they thought no one was working in. But the um, the team on this Kuboto people mover were working in an area that um, the ballast regulator uh, driver and machine controller didn't know and um, collided with it at a, between 11 and 15 miles an hour we've had to make an estimate of speed based on events um, now that is significant that's higher than they should have been traveling which should have been at walking pace and um, so you've got this scenario where in the dark you've got someone driving blind through an area there where they just they don't think there are people working so lots of it lots of things combined to result in this um, accident, which actually ended in life-changing injuries for one of the people on that Kubota. Also possession related, we sometimes get handback incidents. Here's one at Cradle Hall and um, Long World of Rail left. And we're very fortunate with this one in the fact that the first train through, the lifeguard on the front of the train actually threw the rail out. And so we were very fortunate this didn't derail the train and um, through pure fortune. Perhaps even more luckily, we got away with this one as an industry. This is at Kirkham, which is on the line between uh, Preston and Blackpool, which is now electrified. And as part of that electrification work, they're installing these OLE piles. Um, the team on the night put this one down to um, start doing some of the work um, and effectively forgot it was there. It's a black pile in the, on a dark site, and they just left it there, not realizing they'd forgotten it. We were fortunate in the fact the first thing to come across this was a tamper leaving the possession. Um, if it hadn't been that tamper, it would have been the first passenger train of the day. And that first passenger train would have been a pacer, which for any of the, you are familiar with pacers um, are not exactly the most robust of trains. So we were very fortunate that, that were, the tamper spotted this one. Um, not on possession, I'm back. this is one at Cardiff. Um, Cardiff was having a big remodeling done a few years back. Um, and as part of that, um, they were changing the you know, they're changing the junction, they're remodeling the junction. Now, um, there's a train leaving platform seven, going up the Upland Aff line. Um, now, it stops in seemingly the middle of nowhere. And he stops because he doesn't want to go any further, because in front of him is a set of points which are about to divert him over to line Echo. Um, he doesn't want to be over there, he wants to be going to Clan Aff. And if he goes over that crossover, 817 Alpha Bravo crossover, he potentially um, hits an oncoming train. Now, the driver was very switched on. He knew that was wrong. But when he rang the signaller and said, I'm at 817A points, the signaller goes, I'm sorry, which points? 
and 817A and B points didn't exist on the signalers panel because they'd been removed from a signaling perspective, but the points were still in the ground from the P-way perspective. And they should have been clipped and scotched and secured, um, but they'd been used over the weekend for um, moving road valence and things around. And in the kind of hand back at the end of the possession, the two people who, were, who could have secured those points each thought the other was doing. So miscommunication leading to a scenario where we could have had a head-on collision. The signaling system won't stop it because the signaling system don't, doesn't think that 817 A and B points even exist. So um, um, Watford, Watford is a very near miss. We, we, we could have had a very serious incident at Watford um, and we were very fortunate. So um, there's a landslip. Now up on the top of this, um, is the Harry Potter Studios. So if ever you go to the Harry, doing the Harry Potter Studios tour, you're just behind that palace of events. And there's a large area of tarmac which they use for, um, which they use for the filming. And Hagrid's hut is in um, is in the background. If you look at our report, there's an aerial shot with a lot of stuff blurred out, and that's because it's um, the studios and they didn't want us to show, give you a sneak peek of what was going to happen in the next Harry Potter film. So. Um, the, that significant area of impermeable land means there's a lot of water runoff and there's a crest drain at the top of this embankment and that crest drain catches that water runoff and stops it coming into the railway. Now over time that crest, crest drain got full of leaves and twigs and debris and it wasn't performing as it should and one day heavy rainfall led to this landslip and it blocked the um, line into Watford Tunnel and this class 350 at the top right and the one on the right there, the one that's quite dirty, hit this landslip and derailed into the sixth foot. Now, at that exact same time, another 350, this um, 350233, is coming the other way into the tunnel. And these are now heading for a head-on collision because the right-hand train there has derailed into the sixth foot. Now, the reason they only had a glancing blow is the rail actually ended up trapped and wedged between the traction motor and the gearbox on the leading axle. So there's this little gap, you can see in the bottom right hand picture, um, I think the label might have got chopped off on the view that you can see, but that little gap between the traction motor and the gearbox, the rail ended up in there and it acted like a guide. So the six foot rail of the line that the train was on kept the train in line effectively and stopped it straying further to the right. So it only actually got a glancing blow with the other train. That's never a feature that was designed, that is pure good fortune. So we're very lucky at Watford. The um, other thing about Watford, which is um, a little bit sobering, is if you look at the left-hand picture there, you'll see there's a big masonry structure, a big like triangle structure, just to the left of the landslip. That was built because of a previous landslip. But no one really um, had thought about there being another landslip at that location. So there's a little bit of a, of a, um, of a lesson to be learned here about corporate memory, about knowing why the structures on our, on our infrastructure are there because maybe if people had looked at that um, structure and thought, ah, we might have another landslip here in the future. So you've got one landslip directly alongside the, the site of the historic one. Um, just a slightly more unusual one to finish. Um, this is on the South Devon Railway. Um, there's a toilet here which has been secured out of use. It was secured by some wood screws through the frame and into the door, but they weren't really going in that door that well so um when a young lad a young boy comes to go to the toilet he's not big enough to really read the sign he pushes the door and the door actually he manages to overcome the screws that have secured it and the door swings into the toilet now the problem is the toilet floor isn't there so this young lad started to fall into the void effectively and he, that wheel was turning if he'd have fallen in there it probably wouldn't have um, he probably wouldn't have survived it and luckily his mother was able to grab him before he fell in. So we do get some slightly more unusual jobs. You can tell it's a toilet because obviously it's a toilet. Um, just to give you a flavour of some of the things we look at. Um, so, so just to summarise, um, the site phase that we do is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we do a lot of work after that in analysis and then in reporting and consultation and the issues that lie behind that site phase um, are often take much more time stuff and 
we can learn as much from those near misses as we can from the really serious ones. And um, the caveat to that is uh, is that sometimes the serious ones is when people's attention and people's wallets start um, opening, and um, it shouldn't take that, but sometimes it does, unfortunately. Um, something we've seen a few times is that um, accidents are a very good way of looking at your risk assessments and seeing how just how good your risk assessments are. And a lot of the time, when we ask people, "Did you not foresee this happening?" Well, we never thought it would happen, so we never put it in our risk assessment. And um, that kind of idea that these kind of infrequent but catastrophic events never happen is maybe something we all need to think about when we look at our risk assessments. Um, the other thing is that we often find that investigations um, are actually a combination of things happening, and it's not just the engineering side and it's not just the human side, it's the way that those two systems interact. So um, the human being part of the system is what human factors is very often all about. And we look at that in quite some depth, how someone performed given the circumstances they were in. And those circumstances are very much dictated by the railway engineering around them. I mentioned this already that um, investigations very often highlight vulnerability in your risk mitigation and your risk assessments. Um, but they also provide valuable intelligence to fuel your risk assessments. So if, you, um, if you're writing a risk assessment, an investigation can actually be um, a, a bit of a kick at the backside to go, actually, is my risk assessment any good? Um, what they do is they do show to the wider society that we do take safety seriously and that action will be taken and lessons will be learned from accidents and incidents. So that is me. I hope that's been of some interest to you. And um, if you want any more information, our full catalogue of, of reports is on the website. There's my email address. You're more than welcome to message me if you want to talk about anything in particular. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll um, take them out. I've noticed one in the chat from um, Michael. Um, he said, if you have a duty to inform the public, why are urgent safety advices only issued to selected recipients? Seeming the women, the inspector. The, um, with USAs, um, the, we do publish on the website now if we issue a USA. Um, it wasn't originally, it was only targeted at the people the USA was for, but now we actually publish them to the wider world as well. So um, the, that has changed and that's so, so we've recognised that. Which, so hopefully that answers your question that yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen at one point, it was just more targeted, but now we will, we will say that we have issued it. And if we do an investigation with the USA, the USA will be included as part of the investigation in the appendices, if nothing else. Um, John, Barry, in your view, how much did privatisation contribute to the of significant incidents in the late 1990s and early 2000s? Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm going to dodge that one because I don't really have a, an educated opinion on it because I, I wasn't, I only just came into the industry in that period. So everything I know of BR days really is anecdotal. So I'm I'm not going to offer a personal opinion on that one, I'm afraid, John. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much, John. Are there any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes. Uh, if anybody wants to come in. There doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in. Um, so, um, John, just to, um, oh, hold on, there is one. Um, so, Ketrayona, um, would you like to, to come in and ask your question live, please? Uh, yes, I just wondered, you mentioned you do about 300 industry reviews. And are they for incidents that you've maybe previously investigated and that you don't see, you know, a new learning point and that you are happy for the duty holders to proceed with the investigation? I'm just wondering what types of things do you, like, are you available yeah. to review things if somebody asks it or is it only for things that you you have a responsibility to investigate but decide that actually that the duty holder is well placed to investigate? Um, in general, industry reviews are generally for things which only have quite local um, applicability. 
So for instance, if there's, if we go to an incident and it's quite obvious that it's due to a particular component from a particular type of rolling stock, um, for instance, it's quite a local piece of learning. The, um, the people who run that rolling stock are in a far better position to investigate it than us maybe. The only thing we would add is independence. But if we have no real concerns about them doing a decent investigation and it's something very local, then that's the kind of time we would do an IR. Um, the other thing is that very often, um, a lot of IRs, we are the kind of things that maybe we wouldn't investigate anyway, but we think that it might be worth um, spreading the learning from at a later date, potentially. So a lot of IRs we receive, we won't make comment on, but some of them we might. So it's how much involvement we have is just looked at on a case by case basis. Um, but the general thing for IRs is that there's that kind of uh, that idea of local applicability. So if it's uh, another example might be, um, let's say it's a, um, it's local to a particular depot or to a particular part of the country, um, that you know, there's not really a wider issue for the rest of the country, then that might be um, the kind of time an, an industry review would be suitable. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to draw it to, to a close now. Um, so it was very interesting talk. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for it. Um, I've learned an awful lot, you know, through this uh, hour of presentations. You know, some some of the things I already knew, like precursor model, get a good idea of that. Um, formation of uh, of RAIB, you know, the, um, following um, the demise of HMRI. Um, that was quite interesting. Your powers as well as an inspectors, you know, was uh, unknown to me. You know more about the OR of that, uh, at at RIB inspectors. So that was very interesting. And of course, you know, as a track engineers going through the number of um, uh, accident incidents that you went through, and help understanding what the root cause are, uh, is always a, a very good insight. And as you did, I would encourage you know others to go on on read the reports that are on your website. So um, I just need now, I think, to, to thank, thank you very much again on behalf of all the attendees for coming here today and uh, giving this great presentation. Uh, on these good words, um, I'll bring this meeting to a close. Thank you very much for attending, everybody. Thank you.